So I have a question for you, Adam. Do you think a professor at a university who seemed to be completely 100% in favor of and advocating for the horrible terrorist attack by Hamas on October 7th, do you think they should still be a professor? They were advocate. Wait a second here. October 7th, that's when a bunch of people murdered innocent civilians in cold blood. Yes. That's what you're talking. They were in favor of that? What yes. Yes. <laughs> and there's no, no, wait, 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 wait. This is just a theoretical question. Okay. Obviously, okay. it's nothing to do with what we're going to talk about today. Oh, okay. They're in favor of that. They should they still be a professor? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah, heads, interesting. Heads need to roll. Metaphorical heads, of course, not real heads. Right. Sure, sure, sure. Okay. Okay, so we're going to watch a clip. This is uh from Rising. This is Robbie and our good friend uh, Brianna Greyjoy mm -hmm. uh discussing a professor who will <laughs> Said some uh, interesting things and uh, what the university's response is. I'm sure the conversation will be very, you know, normal and intelligent and not crazy at all, right? Of course. Yeah, sure. Of okay. course, yeah. Going deep into the Iron Islands here for this one. <laughs> the Israel Hamas war has caused a surge of pro Israel and pro Palestinian activism on college campuses leading to several cases of censorship. Now, a group of Jewish professors at Columbia University have waded into the discussion about free speech on college campuses in advance of Columbia's president appearing before Congress to answer charges of anti-Semitism allegedly targeting students. Jamil Jaffer, head of Columbia's Knight First Amendment Institute, writes that Jewish faculty at Columbia denounce the weaponization of anti-Semitism and call for the defense of the university as a site of learning, critical thinking, and knowledge production. Really good letter worth reading in its entirety. Hmm. Here's more from the actual letter penned by Jewish professors to the university president. They went on to say that uh, rather than being concerned with the safety and well-being of Jewish students on campuses, the committee is leveraging anti-Semitism in a wider effort to caricature and demonize universities as hotbeds of woke indoctrination. It's Who's saying this? I mean, that's not untrue, right? That's completely accurate. You know, a lot of universities do seem to be hotbeds of woke indoctrination, which is in turn leading to rampant anti-Semitism. Yeah, that's that's factually correct, of course. Mm -hmm. What's the what's the problem here? Letter <laughs> to Columbia University president. Who wrote this letter? Who's the who's who penned this? Uh, that this... professor, or okay. a different? Well, not the professor, not the hypothetical professor. We're talking about a different. Different person that works at the University of Columbia, but this Jamil is Neil Jaffer. Okay, so this is this is Robbie is praising this letter. This is the letter that Robbie is praising. Well, is he praising? He's just talking about it, right? Well, he said it was a great letter. Everyone should check it out. Okay. Well, yeah, then, and good, Brianna then, yeah. was like, ah. <laughs> oh, oh, "Oh, Robbie, how could you? How could you say such a thing?" Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The letter has woke indoctrination. In quotes, Robbie. This letter actually, is racist. I said a bunch of people. That wasn't Jamil Jim, Jeffrey just shared it. A bunch of people uh, penned this penned letter. It. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, actually, I think not to be clear. I think this letter is actually is saying like it's criticizing this. They're, they're not right. agreeing that that colleges are uh, you know hotbeds of woke indoctrination. Right. Hence the reason woke indoctrination is in quotes. Yeah. They're like, this is right-wing propaganda. Exactly, exactly, yep. yeah. Opportunistic use of semitism in a moment of crisis is expanding and strengthening longstanding efforts to undermine educational institutions. After launching attacks on public universities from Florida to South Dakota, this campaign has opened a new front against private institutions. All right, so this was a, a pretty... Uh, audacious and brave move given some of the pressures that they are articulating that they've been experiencing and that pro-Palestine groups, whether they be Jewish groups or Muslim groups or Arab groups or what have you, have said they've been experiencing on college campuses. This has really uh, escalated in the last couple of days, uh, given there's the story about a professor at Hobart and William Smith Colleges named Jody Dean. She was a professor in the political science department who wrote an op-ed for Verso Books that has 
gotten her uh, suspended from her duties. Yes. Um, she. Uh, so I just want to bring up uh, Rihanna. She's the one that brought up Jody Dean here, which I think is interesting. Okay. Robbie didn't bring this up. She decided of her own free will to bring Jody Dean in as the example here. So nicely done. Yes. Apparently said in the piece that she felt exhilarated and energized. No, by let's the... read what she said. She said that this was this was a big point of contention. But what she said in the open. So Robbie said she felt ex you know exhilarated by oh Brianna cuts him off melee. No 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 hold on hold on we got to get it straight from the horse's mouth right. Okay, no, we can't misrepresent. The right. pain on Robbie's face is just palpable right now. Yes, yes. He apparently said in the piece that she felt exhilarated and energized no, by let's the... read what she said. She said that this was, this was a big point of contention, but what she said in the opening of her piece was that images from October 7th of paragliders evading Israeli air defenses were for many of us exhilarating. Here were moments of freedom that defeated Zionist expectations of submission to occupation and siege. In them we witnessed seemingly impossible acts of bravery and defiance in the face of the certain knowledge of the devastation that would follow, et cetera, et cetera. Just, just so I mean, listen, that when you hear it in, in a broader context, it makes it sound even worse. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. I love the argument that she makes here. It's so it's I, so ridiculous. Oh, my God. Yeah, I, it is funny. Like she's reading it. And I don't know. Did she like think that the context was going to make it sound better? And as she's reading it, she realizes it's just as bad, if not. worse. <laughs> well, and then they and then they debate over over the perspective which i just it's like the i get what she's trying to do but you know the nuance there is really going to be lost on people mm -hmm. you'd be like what <laughs> what what are you talking about <laughs> it's like uh freedom right mm -hmm. they're just they're just out out for, they're breaking out of jail they're just out for freedom right C can you imagine if like at, at the end of shawshank redemption like tim robbins character just goes on a murder spree of innocent people <laughs> like would you would you all of a sudden be like oh yeah andy good job you you you, you were wrongfully imprisoned okay you had that coming my favorite part is when andy dufresne uh, after making it out of prison decides to just start murdering <laughs> yeah he goes to a <laughs> local like mall every random person he comes across <laughs> He goes to a local mall and just opens up, right? Yo, imprison me! <laughs> and by the way, this article, like, this isn't one of those articles that was written like, oh, I wrote it on, you know, October 7th. I didn't realize what was going on. This article was written this month, <laughs> okay? <laughs> this oh, wasn't oh, my like, God. And I was sort of like, oh, was before I knew what was going on, you know? This article was written on the 9th of April. Yeah. Oof. Oof. Big oof. We know on the okay. record is, is that not her saying she felt exhilarated and energized by the paragliders? Yeah. You, you don't think that's a fair characterization? You no, know, I don't remember exactly word for what you just said, Robbie, but I just want to make sure we have it on. Do you do object to reading it verbatim? No, I. I... <laughs> <laughs> Look, they're literally hearing two different things. It's awesome. Well, it, it's so because Robbie's like, well, like, OK, wait a minute. Why did you interrupt me to read it like? As if I was categorizing it wrong, and now she's like, "What? But is do you object to it?" Like it was like that wasn't the question. The question is, you you were acting like I was mischaracterizing the statement, and now right. it obviously doesn't seem like I was mischaracterizing it at all. Little goalpost shift there. I was reading from the office of the president of Hobart and William Smith's yeah, letter we should for how read, he characterized We should it. read more from that letter That's as well. That's what I was just about to read. Okay, go ahead. That's what this was not my <laughs> phrasing. This was his <laughs> phrasing. He said. That's so he's good. Getting, he's, he's getting he's the leer. Hey, the hat, the passive aggressive and robbiness. He's like, that's what I was reading. Okay, before you interrupt me, that's what I was reading. Well, at least he's fighting back now, right? That's true. That's true. And she spoke about feeling exhilarated and energized by the paragliders on October 7th. You know, people can decide for themselves. It sounds like that is exactly what she said. I find that utterly despicable and contemptible. However, it is clearly protected um, uh, speech. It is an opinion. She is allowed to have. We want our universities to be places where people can robustly disagree and say things that are provocative and controversial. They have placed her, they're suspending her. She's not teaching right now while they're doing an investigation. I utterly oppose that. Um, I, I don't think they should do that. I, frankly, I don't even think if some policy was violated, she should continue teaching 
until the, you know, the, she shouldn't be suspended anyway, but, uh, but I don't. So I completely disagree with Robert here. Um, I think there's a difference between, I think as a society, we should be trying to advocate on the side of free speech as much as you can for most people, including teachers and professors. And you do want students at colleges. This is a private college, but private and public colleges to have a wide berth of opinions and people coming from different walks of life to give different takes and on everything. We were even talking about this with the NPR story. Like you want to have a, like a wide ideological birth and that's good and that's fine. But I think we can all agree that the people literally cheering on for murdering and raping innocent people and kidnapping innocent people. That's like, can we carve that out and say, okay, that's not a take that we should have, you know, teachers teaching children, right? Can we remove the advocating for murdering innocent people? Can we take that and say, no, that, you know what? We don't want that in our colleges, in our education, right? It's, you know, can we make a little carve out for that one? Yeah, they, they'll frame it as self-defense. I just, I don't think, I think they're, reasoning on the self-defense argument is fallacious because it is they're innocent people they're not the peak they're these are not the people that supposedly you know put them in gaza right right and they're, then even they're targeting, on the yeah even they're targeting the defense, wrong people go ahead right and then even the defense claim is obviously a very contentious one because it's like it's not like oh you know the palestinians were all like you know picking flowers and trying to hug their fellow neighbors when the evil Zionists attacked, right? Obviously, it's a very contentious, complicated history with a lot of violence on both sides and insanity on both sides for, you know, 60 plus years. <laughs> so it's, you know. it's just, it's interesting because whatever fact set you come to this kind of dictates your position on it. Like Brianna has a certain fact set that the Palestinian people are being oppressed and therefore everything they're doing is done in self-defense. And, and even the way she mm -hmm. views this statement by this, this provocative statement is a, 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 a test to that belief. Well, I think it's, a, it's, I think it's even more extreme than that because most people who are like on the, on the left or the far left that are defending or on the more, I shouldn't say defending that are on the more pro Palestinian side of things. Most of them will all give the caveat where they say, I don't like Hamas and what happened on October 7th was obviously immoral, horrible, despicable, right? They'll say all that and then they'll say, but I think Israel sucks and they're killing like way more innocent people. This teacher is not doing that. They're not doing the caveat. They're literally cheering on the October 7th attack and saying it's a good thing. So it's like right. it's a completely new realm of extreme radical philosophy and ideology, which is psychopathic. And I believe that we as a society in America can say, you know what? We don't want radical psychopaths who are advocating for murder of, of innocent people in this kind of barbarity and this kind of behavior. I think we can advocate that those people shouldn't be teaching in private or public schools, period. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. But, but that she'll still claim that, the Palestinian people are acting in self-defense. Yeah, but that's, I mean, I mean, you could, so what? I mean, she yeah. can claim whatever the fuck she wants, right? <laughs> like, of course. Okay, don't, of course. Don't, don't teach it in school. Get out of here, right? I don't want psychopaths teaching this stuff in school. Yeah. And by the way, so this person, Jody Dean, so I looked up her Twitter. Uh, oh, no. Her, her banner says, organize, fight, win, black communist women's political writings. It's her banner. Uh, her Bio says communism is the horizon of our politics, comrade. Yeah. Her avatar is a little cartoon picture of her with the with the little red uh, communist hat on with the hammer and sickle. Well, and you then, really hit it with the psychopath. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And then I uh, so I looked up what was her. You know, we did the October seventh test. Oh no. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was thinking. As soon as you brought right. up her Twitter, I'm like, uh oh. So her, her two tweets, she tweeted twice on October 7th, uh, both times saying from the river to the sea. No Palestinians way. will be free. Wow. Yeah. Palestine will be free. Not Palestine. Palestine will be free. She said this on October 7th. Right. At night. Okay. okay. So like we already know what's going on here. And then on October 8th, she criticized Cornell West because Cornell West, uh, while 
you know, in his statement while advic- while talking about the plight of the Palestinians, said that the reaction was, you know, from Hamas was despicable. And she criticized that. So this is a person who 100% was in favor of the actions of by Hamas. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, uh, <laughs> no hiding her power level. I don't think she has violated a policy. She is allowed to have that opinion. I think the difference is when you read, first of all, it's, I read half of the first paragraph of a lengthy essay, but when you read the essay, it's obvious that she's saying that this is an occupied people. This is not a kind of a subjective term. This is a term that's been wielded by every international humanitarian organization that you want to cite, Amnesty International, on down the list. Um, and that the images of an occupied people breaking down the walls and literally being able to fly over and overcome the barriers that have been not just symbols of, but literal um, implements of their occupation um, and their subjugation, uh, their, quote, submission to occupation and siege, was exhilarating as a symbol of a potential end to that occupation. Whether or not you think it was strategic. Wait, 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 wait. Okay, hold on, hold on. First of all, Brianna, if you're going to go defend the person who's supporting Hamas on October 7th, you should probably read more than like the first paragraph of their article. Right? Of course. Yeah, you should read the whole thing. <laughs> yeah, like, I don't know. I mean, it's a long article. Like, I skimmed it. I'm not going to read the whole thing either. But nowhere in it that I saw, there's no part where they ever say, you know, oh, it's not like the person said, oh, I saw the images of the people flying over the walls. And at first I found, you know, they're free, they're freeing themselves from their prison and it's exhilarating. But then I realized that they were like coming, that they were flying over the walls in order to, you know, kill and kidnap people and rape people and commit all sorts of horrible violence. And, you know, that is what, you know, that kind of like destroyed my visions of freedom. No, that part never happens. The second part that you expect never comes. It's just nothing but praise and saying that everyone should basically be siding with the Palestinians on October 7th. And the article itself is even called Palestine Speaks for Everyone. And wow. then the sub the subtitle of this, it's a blog post, so I'm assuming that she came up with a title and subtitle, is Against those who would separate good and bad Palestinians resisting occupation onslaught, Jody Dean writes in defense of the radical universal emancipation embodied in the Palestinian cause. So hmm. it is pretty wacky that, that Brianna is just reflexively. I don't know if, if Brianna is like becoming more and more on the side of like defending October 7th or if she's just reflexively defending this because of her political position. Brianna believes the concentration camp narrative, the open air prison camp narrative. Yes, she does. Yeah. yeah. Which obviously that believing that narrative affects your thinking in of course all this. it sure. frames it as self-defense it's how they frame it as self-defense right but even if you were to believe that which you know i don't and you don't we you know we even covered a video they were you know before october 7th that was kind of going over some like you know random things about what life was like in gaza and yeah, sure it's I like you that. know yeah, it's not like we were know, looking up restaurant reviews. In right. Yeah, it's not like a thriving, you know, you know, capitalist economy, you know, first world country. But it wasn't, you know, to characterize it as an open air prison concentration camp is insane and not accurate. Right. Yeah. They want to characterize it as Auschwitz. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, but, you know, so but putting it all aside, like even if you did think it was Auschwitz, you can still it's just like the easiest thing in the world to just say, you know, I don't agree with them doing all this horrible stuff. Right. Right. You know, it, but, but even you can't even get that little tiny kernel of like, you know, sanity in some of these conversations. No, they love it. They thrive on the chaos. They just mm -hmm. dig it. They like triggering people. Uh, this Maybe. is kind of rage bait, I think. And it worked. I mean, we're all talking about it. So. Do you think it's right? I don't know. I think she, I think both Brianna and Jody Dean believe what they're saying. I don't think it's just like bait. They believe what they're saying. Yeah. Yeah. And they want to bring attention to their cause. What better way um, to do that than to trigger that? <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. Or morally um, permissible. Uh, for the occupate the the breaking down the the uh, oppression the I'm sorry resistance to the occupation to take the form that it did on October seventh I think it's clear to say that she wasn't 
are making the case that murdering civilians, for instance, was exhilarating. She was making the case that tearing down the wall, bulldozing through the wall that was I mean, closing an occupied people, people, people the was paragliders did. They went and murdered people. Yeah. Thank you, Robbie. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. But that's what they did. Look, they weren't trying to escape. They didn't have a <laughs> ship waiting so that they could sail off into the night. No, they grabbed a bunch of women and took them back to Gaza and dragged them into a hole in the ground. Jeez. Oh, John, I love Robbie. As a matter of fact, but you know, they, that's what they did, though. <laughs> that's what they did. Like you look, you lose the moral high ground as soon as you start taking innocent people hostage. Just yeah. the end. No. Yeah. Like. So, and this is a conversation that we've had before. I know we really disagree, but international law is clear that an occupied people does have a right to resist and they have a right to resist violently. So going back. Violently against. What? <laughs> violently against who? Who? Dude, what, the, what the? What is she talking about? I don't think international law says you get, get to, if you're being attacked, that you get to just start killing innocent people and kidnapping innocent people who are just like randomly walking around because they're part of the <laughs> same country. I mean, doesn't this kind of completely destroy their argument about what Israel is doing to Gaza? Because their yes. whole argument is Israel is killing a bunch of innocent people. They shouldn't kill innocent people. Yeah, no shit. Yeah. Yes, you're right. I mean, it, that is what's kind of hilarious is that she's making the same argument as the people who are saying, yeah, Israel should just like blow everyone up and who cares because, you know, they have to get the bad people. So it's okay if they kill as many innocent people, right? Right. Yeah. And she's making the same argument. She is just with different people. <laughs> I thought we were going to let the innocent people live. <laughs> I'm for letting them live. That's because you're a fool, Adam. <laughs> I don't think, it's look, I, okay. I don't think we should kill, I don't think, I don't think we should kill innocent people. I don't think that's a hot take. Okay. That is a very hot take. All right. Back to the liberal the, centrist. Do not, not wanting right innocent to people to kill, kill random people at a music festival. That's right. But they home. do have, oh, oh my God. We got to back people. it up. Aren't making that case. Okay. Ready? Yeah. <laughs> Let's go that murdering civilians, for instance, was exhilarating. She was making the case that tearing down the wall, bulldozing through the wall that was I mean, closing an people occupied people was exhilarating. the paragliders did. They went and murdered people. Yeah. Like. So, and this is a conversation that we've had before. I know we really disagree, but international law is clear that an occupied people does have a right to resist, and they have a right to resist violently. So going back to the... The, they do not have the right to kill random people at a music festival. That's right. In but they homes. do have the right to resist and the right to resist violently. So if you're talking about October 7th, as she di is doing here, you can have a conversation about whether or not you think resistance and targeting military targets and killing military targets was permissible under international law and frankly exhilarating as opposed to the murder of innocent civilians, which is tragic and unconscionable, right? You should be able to have that kind of conversation. And I think that's the kind of conversation she was trying to have here. Now it's- I think, look, I, I like that. So Brown has just, who hasn't admittedly, hasn't read the article, has now invented an argument for this woman to defend her. Right. Okay. She's like, oh no, she was trying to make an argument about like, it's okay to, you know, paraglide out of your, you know, prison walls to attack military targets and not to kill innocent people. That's not the argument she's making at all in the, the article at all. That's not the argument she's making at all. The article, the argument she's making is that people need to STFU essentially. And that when people are fighting for their liberation, they, you know, are, they do whatever yeah. they want, essentially. And that the Palestinians, because of the history of subjugation, you know, obviously completely one-sided from Jody Dean's perspective. You know, it just completely justifies them doing anything, and everyone needs to STFU about it. That was her point, Brianna. You're just right. you just created a fake point on air for no reason. Well, for a reason, for an emotional, defensive reason. Even though when you admitted in the beginning of the clip that you didn't read anything past like the first paragraph of the article, does she say? I haven't read the article, so I don't. I don't know. But does she say the? Tar targeting innocent people does she frame them as not innocent people a lot i know a lot of people make the argument that you know hassan said this you know even babies are settlers right anyone who's there is a fair game because they're occupying they're so an occupying she, force she so she doesn't explicitly say like to the extent that the the second thought people did were like oh they're all settlers but she's sort of like implicitly like, 
oh, oppressed people can fight back against their oppressors by any means they choose. And it's like, well, who are their oppressors? Like, you know, if you're not going to categorize who exactly the oppressors are, and then you're going to also talk about settlements, like it all is leading you down this pathway. You know? That's still not a good argument because if just killing innocent people is the way that you're going to get back at your oppressors, that's right. not, you're not actually attacking your oppressors, right? No. Very often, yeah. not enough. Very often, you're making things completely worse for your movement, which yep. is essentially exactly what Hamas did. They completely made everything worse for everyone in Gaza. Interesting to note the specific language that the college, Hobart and William Smith colleges, used in their letter explaining why she was suspended. She says, the colleges recognize and affirm the importance of free speech and ideas. We have worked tirelessly to create an environment where we can discuss hard issues upon which we may disagree. But we can never and will never condone or praise violence, particularly when that violence is directed at individuals based on their religion, race, or national origin. So I, one thing to point out there is that, of course, this, this, this standard that we do not condone violence does not obviously apply. We talk about people uh, who are praising the United States retaliation against various acts of war directed against us, whether it's 9-11 or the like. We're having a conversation now about whether or not... She, wait, 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 <laughs> wait, 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 wait. You can't compare the conversation people are having talking about America's response to 9-11 as someone advocating for October 7th. That'd be like, I don't think we should have a teacher who was teaching at colleges who, who was taking the Hassan Piker position and and saying that, you know, America deserved 9-11 or, pra or even worse, directly praising 9-11. Should America, in America, should we have professors running around teaching students that America, does, you know, should have gotten 9-11 and that that was actually a good thing? I would prefer not. Yeah. <laughs> but I don't know what the, I don't know what the hell kind of bullshit conflation that Brianna is trying to make here. Cause we don't have anything like that. If there was a professor who was like, and I'm pretty sure we've literally covered Brianna talking about this. If there are professors that are like, Oh, we should, you know, take out every Palestinian glass, the area, kill all of them, blah, 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 blah. I don't think that those people should be teaching students either. If they're especially if they're teaching that shit to their students. We should, is, is it really so difficult? Like, it's so obnoxious. People are so stupid and they take advantage of the complexity of language where, you know, first of all, Brianna Greydoy doesn't believe in freedom of speech whatsoever. So this is a bullshit argument she's making anyway. But we can live in a society where we are on the side of freedom of speech and freedom of ideas and trying to get, you know, a a, like a large assortment of people with different ideologies, but still exclude the ones that are just so toxically, disgustingly you know, destructive, like advocating for the murder and kidnapping of innocent people. We can do that. We can do that. We're smart enough to do that without going down the slippery slope of totalitarianism. All right. It's a ridiculous argument. No, I mean, I'm more on Robbie's side as far as being able to debate these ideas in a debate class. I mean, you can't really just say categorically that you sh no one should be able to voice these caustic opinions yeah That's but there's a, a difference but, between if students want to debate it in class and if even yeah. a teacher wants to like say like okay here's our debate topic and it's that i'm totally fine with that yeah That's yeah great yeah. right yeah that's very different than the teacher like advocating for this thing to their students in a well, not especially in a not debate class it's in some kind of one of these like uh you know like uh resistance yeah, to yeah, genocide yeah. you know minors or something <laughs> Ooh. Uh, I saw someone had a minor in resistance to justice. I know, so I <laughs> and I was like, what? Yes. That is a, that's a real thing? That's that is a real thing. <laughs> someone, yeah, someone in a news story who they were going to give the valedictorian speech and then they- Oh, yeah, you're right. Got, that's it who got, it was. Uh, revoked. Yeah. And it, they had like, I forget, a, they had like minor, a major in yeah. like biochemistry and a minor in resistance to genocide. <laughs> of course, you never major in resistance to genocide, yeah. right? <laughs> you always major in biochemistry because then you can get right. a good job. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, I, I, I get what you're saying. And look, if this is this person's personal opinion, that's also different. Like the, where, where it becomes a problem is when they go in and just teach that these lies is basically fact. They teach this fact pattern, which leads you to believe that 
these things are permissible or or even good that's mm -hmm. where i have a problem so or not, uh, Israel is going to escalate and retaliate against the Iranian strikes, which of course were retaliation against Israel's violence against their embassy in Damascus in the first place. Do we live uh, in the country that has- You know, I'm totally fine with people referring to Iran's drone attack on Israel as, you know, in response to them blowing up the consulate building, because that's true. That's totally fine. But it's really obnoxious to me when I hear people like Brianna and Hassan and all these other people that keep saying that. They always say it's a response to that, but they always leave out the, well, why did Israel blow up their consulate building, right? It, was it because the guy inside and the people inside were helping arm Hezbollah, which is a, you know, a terrorist organization that's attacking Israel, right? They always leave that part out of it. Like, oh, you know, the Iranian consulate building was just minding its own business. And then evil Israel just came and blew it up for no reason. So that part makes them look bad. Come on. Oh, okay. Okay. You, you know how this, you know how this works. And then they hypocritically will complain like, "Oh, the people are only they're saying it's one sided. They're they're not talking about the fact that you know they're acting like this attack by Iran on Israel is completely unprovoked. Meanwhile, they act like like Israel attacking the Casa building was completely unprovoked. They always forget. This is such a tit for tat struggle. Yes. I often wonder. You just if you ask them. Straight up, would would you accept if both sides just just let the past be the past, let bygones be bygones? Like, wouldn't that be a, a the best case scenario for everyone involved? It should, I don't you think, think they can. Right. I, don't I don't think, think, think they can right. do that though. I think Brianna would. She's she's too ticked off about the past, all the oppression that's been dumped on the Palestinian people. I learned about that in college. Okay, <laughs> that's not going to go away. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. revenge needs to be had mm -hmm. damn it that is a good question to ask them of course yeah, yeah. look sooner or later someone has to start thinking about the future instead yep. of this mindless tallying of the slights of the past right. it's just insane yeah Perpetrated perhaps the most violence um, but from our government of any other country in the world to date with the world's largest army and all of those kinds of things. So a statement that this is about the, the condoning, not condoning violence is quite, quite frankly on its face false. Right. Moreover, the idea that this was targeted to people based on their religious race or national origin, when it, it that's akin to saying anti-Semitism is anti-Zionism. Anti anti She's making an argument against... Well, no listen to the, the listen to what the categories were again okay for the idea that this was targeted to people based on their religious race or national origin what was that last one what was that last national one? origin is national that like, origin oh is it, are they talking about israel again okay <laughs> national origin right like so like discriminate against someone because they're from israel would be discrimination on someone of their national origin right like literally by definition you know when it, it that's akin to saying anti-Semitism is anti-Semitism is anti-Zionism. She's making an argument no, against not. a Zionist project, uh, a, a, a state that has created itself for religious purposes in the name of a religion. But the the problem with is Israelis and Zionism is not that the people are Jewish. This is not an attack on Jewish people in Philadelphia. This is not an attack on Jewish people in France. This is a condemnation of a political system um, that has, by necessity. Uh, forced the uh, expulsion and subjugation of millions of Palestinian people over the last 75 years. And so how you can say, I'm, I'm, you cannot- I don't know what she, what, what she mean by by necessity. I don't know what that means. Unless she's, I guess, this would be my guess what she means by that. Cause she just, she talked to Norman Finkel scene not long ago. I remember. And you know, he, he brought up in that like really long debate he had with Destiny and the other guy whose name escapes me, uh, the other guy wrote in a book, he wrote something about like how the Zionist project necessitated um, basically taking, you know, the land of native people. And then the guy in response to that said, okay, but if you actually read like the section of the book that I wrote with honesty, what I said was that the, that the plan from the beginning was not to, you know, t kick anyone off their land. It's just that once people were immigrating to the, the region and all this violence kind of uh, started and the native population 
you know, was so anti-immigration and so, you know, you know, wanted to basically not sell land to any Jews and any of this stuff and was also violent. And then with the war and everything that happened afterwards, it became like a necessity. And then Norman just completely dishonestly ignored everything he said, continued to repeat that. And to this day, it's kind of like disgusting to this day, whenever Norman has one of these appearances, he just keeps repeating the lie, even though the guy who wrote the line directly said, you took out what I said out of context. And he just, he, it's like almost just to do it intentionally to piss him off. He just keeps repeating the lie every time he's on the air now. So he's, he's saying that it became a necessity because of the security threat. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Condone violence here when presumably you can condone support of an Israeli state that has itself um, subjected Palestinian people to so much violence. And it is currently in the course of a siege on a population of 2.3 million civilians uh, or who are largely civilians um, is is a kind of asymmetry there. Yes, I think it's obvious. Who cares if it's largely civilians? I thought it's fine, right? If we're fighting the bad people, right? Who cares if they're civilians that are dying? That's, that's what the lady's point was. Obviously, something being conflated here. Because, I mean, people, in truth, people support violence when it is self-defense. Most people think violence is, in some cases, right. called for, is an appropriate response. Right. When you are threatened with violence, you don't have to, if, if you are, if someone is aggressing against you, you're allowed to defend yourself, that countries and their police forces and their armies can defend the country with violence. So it's not really like for or against violence. What I found pernicious about that statement from the, the university president was he's He's, he's conflating those things and making it sound like her political views, again, political views I find absolutely and utterly loathsome, are, the, are like a threat on the campus population when it's not like to, to the, the kind of violent speech that should not be permissible is to like actually threaten a specific student, right? right. To say that they're threatened because she expressed a political opinion is exactly the kind of slippery slope and how we end up attacking free speech on college campuses that is not. Yeah, I mean, you and I have had I, this conversation. Yeah. I think that's an absurd position for Robert to, to, to bring out. Well, yeah, I want to just see what your position is because you're you're kind of against that because it just fosters this kind of atmosphere where people can be belligerent and hint at no. violence without any sort of ramification. I it's not that's not I mean from the broader perspective, I don't want teachers teaching children um, ideas that are basically setting them up for violence and setting them up to destroy America. Okay? Right. I don't want that. You know, you can teach ideas that criticize American policies, but this leftist garbage is setting people up to destroy America and to hate America. And I don't think that should be taught, at least um, taught prescriptively in school. But Robbie's point specifically is kind of, is really fucking wrong in this case. Because like, imagine if, and I'll use an easier example to, to for this point, like if that woman, the Jody Dean lady was talking about, uh, you know, in South Africa, you know, uh, black South Africans basically killing white South Africans and taking their land on the basis of like, oh, you know, because you oppressed us, you know, or people that look like your you or ancestors, your ancestors yeah. yeah, oppressed us, you know, via apartheid some years ago. And then the woman, Jody Dean, you know, supported that action. She's supporting the action that, you know, oh, hey, look, just because you're white, it's totally okay for you to get murdered because of something that you didn't do, just because someone who shares your skin color did, right? That's what she's teaching. That's what she's advocating for. The same thing here. But this person who's advocated for this, they're saying, well, just because you're a person who lives in Israel, who's not Arab, it's totally fine for you to get murdered by a Palestinian. It's totally fine for you to get kidnapped by a Palestinian. Why, number one, why is that bigotry something that you want to teach? But number two, that totally is a threat to students on campus because number one, A, a it'd be very threat. easily a personal threat, right? Yeah. Because number one, it'd be super fucking easy for anyone, anyone to cross the very, very thin line between, oh, Israeli and American Jew. And even if, you know, if it's just, if they could kind of keep it in the realm of Israeli. So what if, so an Israeli person can't go to school at this college because there's, there's a teacher that's advocating that they, as an Israeli citizen, should be able to be subjected to violence because something their government did that they don't have control over. I'm sure there probably are Israeli students at the college. Right. Yeah. Yeah. 
conversation in the show where I brought up the Haitian Revolution as an example, a revolution that is heralded as the first um, revolution of enslaved people rising up and uh, securing their own freedom from themselves, but a revolution that also happened with bloodshed, including the bloodshed of, of a lot of innocent civilian people and yes, children. Widespread And massacre. the idea that um, a college wouldn't, would fire a professor for saying the Haitian Revolution was a good thing, that the Haitian Revolution was exhilarating in its um, achievement of freedom for an enslaved population. I mean, it's difficult to imagine. Now, maybe we will get to that world. We're not allowed to say the Haitian Revolution is good because some innocents were killed, but you are allowed to say the Iraq War was good. Um, you're, you are allowed to say... I mean, you're, you're totally right, Adam, that she's just so... Her brain is so melted on this topic because she's like literally comparing, you know, Palestinians to sl literal slaves in Haiti. Yeah. <laughs> okay. People were literally kidnapped from another country and brought against their will halfway across the world to be slaves. And she's comparing that to, you know, the people that were living in Gaza. Yeah. That's the way they see it. That's the facts who, that they come to this debate with. Who, who voted for their own government, which then their government became a brutal mafiosa type uh, organization that steals all of its own res the resources of its, of, of its own people for its own political gain. Right. She's comparing that to literal slavery that happened in the you know, 1800s, 1700s. Okay. There's no rhyme or reason to it. Such. Right. You and can't then convince also, her otherwise. I know. And then also there's still, and there's even a difference. There's a difference between someone saying, Hey, now, listen, I'm not some scholar of the Haitian Revolution, so I don't know enough to comment about it. But there's a difference between saying like, hey, you know, it's a good thing that slaves were able to not be slaves anymore. And that's good. It's very different than saying, oh, it's a good thing that, you know, in the process of that, they they brutally murdered, kidnapped and sexually assaulted, you know, a bunch of random innocent people. Right. Like those are two completely different statements. <laughs> right. What do you think their take would be if someone on that campus wanted to come out and say that American slavery was actually good for black people. I don't think they'd be very happy. <laughs> they'd probably lose their minds. In fact, you know, if I was on that college campus and, and that woman didn't get, you know, mm -hmm. kicked off, I would just start trolling. I would literally start, you know, making those. Kinds. You would start make, saying that kind of stuff. I would just like, I make try to make the most egregious arguments to, to trigger the left to see what their response would be like. Oh, I thought, what? I thought you guys were all free speech. What's going on? Yeah. Oh, yeah. This is the time to do it, isn't it? Yeah, because you know the whole thing and the way that, you know, the programming software that Brianna's operating off of and the programming software that, first of all, this Jody Dean character doesn't believe in free speech. She's a communist. Right. She's a literal socialist communist on her Twitter. She does not believe in free speech whatsoever. Okay. <laughs> by, by their ideological position. But yeah, they're all operating under the software of, you know, P plus P equals R. You know, oppression, you know, oppression, oppressor. So they say, oh, well, you know, as long as I can view you as the oppressor, you know, anything I do and believe is justified. I don't have, there doesn't have to be any level of, of, uh, you know, universality or consistency in their opinion. Yeah. I mean, I think it's a disgusting opinion that, that people do argue that slavery was actually beneficial for black people. Mm hmm. That's a completely abhorrent position, but I, if someone did argue for that on this campus, they would say that it was a tangible threat to, to black people. Right. Even though it's difficult to see how that would be a, you know, a, mo a current day tangible threat to black people in the same way that these kind of Palestinian protests do seem like more of a tangible threat to Israeli or Jewish students. Mm-hmm. Right? Because, I mean, they're just saying back in the past. Right? Yeah, no, this is uh, obviously uh, ideology is taken over here. It's there, there's, there's no consistent measure that they're operating under. So, not nice job, Robbie, for standing <laughs> up for free speech, but <laughs> it's never going to work. What are you doing? The, the, the dropping the uh, in, using atomic bombs in World War II was good, which I 
was a conversation that was had by a law professor of mine when I was in law school. So again, is this really about condemnations of violence? Is this really about whether or not you can holistic, you know, say that any part of an event it cannot be good if there was but there were bad aspects of it, if there was cruelty or killing of civilians or tragedy as a part of it, or is this an ideological war that is being framed in these kinds of safetyism terms? Mm. More rising right after this. <laughs> Robbie's, <laughs> Robbie's so over it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, this is, I mean, when, how does this resolve, Sitch? How does this... I just, I feel like we're just having the same back and forth over and over and over again. No one's going to change their mind. Everyone's mind is made up. How are things going in Gaza? What, how, when you say, how is it going to resolve? What do you mean? Are you talking about the situation in Gaza? Are you talking about the speech conversation in America? Like, Well, this, I mean, I could see the conflict in Gaza being resolved and there's still being these protests on college campuses because it's just, they're like on a, on a mission. This is their, their religious revival now. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. It ha it's just, it's completely unmoored from anything that's actually going on in the middle East. I know. I mean, I think it's similar to like the BLM protest where, you know, people, and, and I think you talking about it as like a religious revival is accurate. And there will be people who, when the situation has changed or calmed down or whatever, was resol is resolved to the extent of, you know, the current situation. There will be, you know, most people I think will stop focusing on it, and there will be some subsect of people that they gain too much energy, too much life force by dedicating their time to caring about this, to protesting about this, et cetera, et cetera, and they'll continue forward. But I think overall it'd be like BLM where you had all this energy and movement and then it kind of just like people just get kind of bored with it <laughs> after a while. And they and move just, on. They just move on to find something else, you know, until the next thing happens. Well, that so. sucks. I mean, but that's the way it seems like things, these things kind of go. You know, people get bored with these situations that are, you know, like with the, the BLM stuff, nothing. First of all, I mean, it's kind of a fake issue in the first place. But in terms of there being some like massive disproportion of unarmed black men being killed by the police, but nothing, not that many things really changed substantially um, that they wanted, that they were advocating for. And yet the energy all kind of dissipated eventually, you know, after a few months. Yeah, they gave up. It's, it's just because there, it, there's nothing really there in the first place. It seems like to be that's the case. You know, there's like this, these flashes of energy. You know, probably a lot of it had to do with people who were just wanting to get outside because of, you know, lockdowns, right? <laughs> and they're just got like this flash of energy and then it kind of just dissipates because, you know. That's so funny. Uh, Metal Face Rose for Fight says, would it be sexist to do a tier list of hot, crazy, lefty female political commentators ranked by how insane I think the sex would be? Yes. But maybe a little bit. Maybe just a tiny bit. It would I think be, you should but... still do it, but maybe yeah, a little bit. Okay. Doesn't mean it's wrong. Right. <laughs> it just means it's sexist. Uh, the Real Halton here for $4. Thank you. Says, oh boy, what a wonderful title. <laughs> Good job, Adam. And oh, they great. said, uh, Tiffany Henyard's lieutenant indicted. Oh, really? Interesting. Tiffany Henyard, that's the, the super mayor, right? The corrupt super mayor lady. Really? Wow. Yeah, yeah we I haven't was... covered that story yet. We should. No, yeah, we haven't really covered it. I know Nate the lawyer and Sean have talked about Both it. Both covered it, yeah. Pretty good coverage on it, yeah. Alert Chance Ask Watch for Drew Dollar says, Weird how Brie always points out who the Jews are. <laughs> Is that the weaponized <laughs> anti Semitism she's complaining about? There you go. Uh, TL1524 for $10 says, Get ready to make another episode based on today where Brie scolds Robbie after he said protesters should be moved out of the street. Bree said, no, people should suck it up because Gaza. <laughs> Sitch and no Adam way. here to say. No way. Oh, really? Does she have That's, a video? Where... Yeah, well, they shut down the Golden Gate Bridge. Yeah, if you oh. don't know, there was a bunch of protests uh, the other day with you know people protesting against Israel. And as you said, Adam, yeah, one of the protests was people literally shutting down the Golden Gate Bridge. Um, there are a bunch of people that were basically, again, blocking off airport access. And it's just... 
I don't like no one likes no who okay you're you're attacking innocent people that's exactly what you're doing and those, you're making them all have, hate you yeah they all hate your guts it's so stupid like during the civil rights movement okay you go oh we're gonna do a sit-in are we gonna do a sit-in in front of an airport and like fuck everyone's day over no we're gonna do a sit-in at the restaurant that won't serve us because either the restaurant is racist or the laws are racist and won't allow won't allow us access to the restaurant right it's like they're protesting the direct thing that you know right. you're referring yeah. to. Just doing these like random acts where you just piss everyone off. It I mean, listen, I think they should do more of it. I think more stupid college kids should go out there and they should protest against Israel by blocking off bridges and airports. I think they should just make everyone's life as miserable as possible. I applaud these actions. Okay. I think this will definitely get america on their side and on these radical leftist pr protesters side i think they should do more of it i disagree I don't think <laughs> okay they, i look they're attacking innocent people like the people stuck in their cars they it's not like they can do a ceasefire in gaza like it's not like they're the ones bombing gaza they're completely innocent to the whole topic so they attack them make their lives miserable and then to add insult to injury, the people that they claim to care about, these innocent people that are being killed in Gaza, it makes more people not give two shits about those people. They're like dead babies in Gaza. Who fucking cares? I have to get to work. Like, it's just, it's a horrible situation all around. From the, yeah, obviously from the, you know, Gazan perspective, it's horrible. I'm looking at it more from the perspective of, I just want America to hate these radical leftists ideology and these kids that are promoting it right yeah and this is a good way to get people to just hate their <laughs> well, that's that's true i just it's it's so funny well not funny it's actually horrible it's so horrible because they're doing the exact same thing that the hamas people did right. attacking well, innocent people for n no good reason it's it's because so those protesters that are going out there to like block bridges and airports they don't care they don't know. They literally don't care about Palestinians. No. You know, it's, it's funny. I actually, <laughs> I've been watching Community again. Oh, no. Dan Harmon. Um, Dan Harmon, yeah. Community was so ahead of its time in the character of Britta. Right. Okay, if, you, if you haven't seen. She's like the social justice type, right? Right. If you haven't seen Community, it's the first, like the first like three seasons are, are great. It has some problems after that, but the first two seasons are great. And this show came out, I think it started in like 2009 or something. So it was like a lot of like pre woke stuff, but obviously a lot of these woke ideas and this woke stereotype of like the college kid who, you know, pretends to care about all these like causes and is just, you know, rubbing in everyone's face in a really obnoxious way was becomes this character called Britta. She becomes the, the stereotype of this California, you know, person. And it's so hilarious because it's so accurate to what's going on with wokeness and it shows that wokeness was just this like stereotype of this person that now spread and the episode i just watched where it's like she reads in the newspaper that a friend of hers was protesting in the middle east and got like tear gas and arrested and she's like upset and jealous that here she is in college trying to get like a degree when her friend is getting <laughs> is getting a facebook group you know for people advocating for her to be free because she got tear gas and so she's like trying to stage like these like really stupid protests that don't mean anything whatsoever just because she wants the attention. And That's it's perfect. it's so much as like what's going on with these stupid kids that are like blo blocking airports and bridges because like number part of it is they just want attention. And part of it is is they're just people even if they really like think they care about the Palestinian plight, like they can actually feel like real visceral anger about it. They're, there's nothing I kind of despise more than on an emotional deep emotional level and i don't know why but people who they feel some anger that could be a hundred percent justified they have a deep seated emotional anger that could be completely justified and they're so fucking stupid these people are so stupid so ignorant so lazy that instead of actually directing their anger and their energy in something that's productive to actually help whatever the problem is they just lash out at the people around them they just lash out at the world and, and that's what these stupid kids are doing they're like i'm so angry about what's going on in gaza that i'm just gonna lash out the world even though even though anyone 
that has an IQ above room temperature would realize that all they're doing is harming their own movement. Yeah. They don't care because it's not about that. It's literally not about helping their movement. It's the same. It's the same exact thing with Hamas. And it's, I think what you were talking about, Adam, with them like hurting his people, it's the same exact emotion. You have people who, for, for very justified reasons, could feel an emotion of anger and injustice that could be justified. But instead of doing something productive, something that would actually help alleviate their system and alleviate, I mean, their plight and alleviate the plight of people around them, they just lash out at people with when any just modicum of thought would say, okay, you doing that is going to make everything worse than you. For, for you, and they don't care. They don't care because it's not actually about changing anything for the better. It's about alleviating the emotion. That's all it is. It's about, I have all this pent up emotion, all this pent up anger, and I just need to release it in whatever way is possible. And it's the most selfish, stupid, self-destructive shit that a human can ever do. Yeah, it's a waste. It's a waste. Yeah, I feel your pain because it is... If that energy could be devoted to some sort of political activism that was actually useful, mm -hmm. it would be it would be amazing. I, yeah. I was watching a clip from the Young Turks where Anna was talking about these people that are going to these these city council meetings and complaining about Gaza, and like she's so frustrated because she's like, "We have problems here. <laughs> we have local problems here." And you're taking up everyone's time to talk about something that's happening halfway around the world. You idiots. Which, which the local council has no control over anyway. I know exactly. You're here in front of people who can actually make tangible change in your life. <laughs> and you're complaining about something they have no power over. Yep. You idiots. You yep. idiots. It, it is painful. <laughs> it is. It is painful. Yeah. It's just a waste. Look, and as human beings, I think we all kind of intrinsically understand, you know, time is a, is a limited resource. You know, energy is a limited resource, money and, and, uh, you know, all these are limited resources and it just sucks to see them go to waste like this. Just so somebody can have some emotional, psychological release. Oh, I got off. Oh, look, I'm so popular. <laughs> I virtue mm -hmm. signaled for for Palestine, for my teacher, my college professor. Ah, uh, I'm so good. I mean, yeah, basically. It is selfishness. It is. It is. It's selfishness masquerading as, you know, virtue. Yeah. Uh, IP Daily for nine months says, I prefer Adam and Sitch over Sitch and Adam. <laughs> Ass over, over SA show. <laughs> Yeah, look. There you go. Ass over sass, baby. Well, I mean, SA means it's that's the typical abbreviation for sexual assault. That's why. Well, that's why it would like, be ass over sass, right? Yeah. It's SAS. Well, I just, it's just, it's so obvious why Sitch likes this, doesn't want to change the name. I mean, it'd be so Because it's better. better. What do you mean? It'd Sitch so much better, and Adam. It's just so, it just sounds so much better. Okay. I mean, not according to the super team. <laughs> what do they know? What does IP Daily know? Metal Face Rose for $5 says the problem is they would use her firing to justify people with pro-Israel opinions. If there are people with pro-Israel opinions that are like, you know, just go glass everyone, kill all the Palestinians, and I'm fine with getting rid of those people too. I don't think that should, I don't think you should have professors that are advocating this stuff to students. Just the mass slaughtering, you know, innocent civilians. This is it's a psychotic thing. And I think, and I and I think we can craft a world and a society where we don't have to be so afraid of the slippery slope where we let all the craziest shit go by. Right? We're not going to allow it. Like we're not going to allow a teacher who's advocating that they should, you know, that like children and babies, you know. Sorry, go ahead. We're not going to let a teacher who's advocating for the uh, Amos Yee position, right? That babies and children can consent. We would say, get that teacher out of the school, like immediately, right? <laughs> no, just leave them in the school, but hang them. Oh, okay, right there you go, right? <laughs> so I'm just saying, so I think we could make, I think you just try to draw a distinction between like the people advocating for murdering innocent people. You know, I think we can make these distinctions. 
It is Afro- tough, though. It is tough. I don't think because you do. You, look, you want to maximize freedom of speech, and a lot I don't of the think problems. It's that difficult. Well, look. This is why I brought up the the like the caustic position on you know the black slaves had it better back when because people will characterize people will characterize any position as a threat to others i mean that's right. what the whole safetyism is but but the thing is the difference is okay and it, by the way if it, if a professor advocate for that position i don't think they should be fired for that position necessarily okay right um Per- the personally, the different not teaching it in the classroom though. That's a difference. Right. But no, but yeah. the difference is we as part of what we've done as societies, we've all been like, okay, we're trying to be as maximally free speech as possible. But one of the lines we've all agreed to draw is not advocating for violence. Okay. It's kind right. of like one yes. of the core tenets of living in our liberal Western democracy is that we're supposed to solve problems with political processes and the court system and talking and not through murdering each other. And when you have people that are advocating against those norms, the very norms that are the very structure of our society and advocating for, you know, violence, especially not even self-defense violence, violence against innocent people, that is crossing the line. And I would, and I would say cross that line at your peril, moving the Overton window to say that that kind of speech is acceptable, I think is incredibly dangerous. Yeah. It's so, it's so weird because you've, you phrased it perfectly. It, we have, as a society, kind of made threats of physical violence socially unacceptable. Right. And, and this is exactly why they try to turn speech into violence. They say, exactly. look, speech exactly. is violence. Therefore, right. you can't say that shit because that's literal violence to me. But then, at the same time, they're like, oh, violent speech against your oppressors. Well, that's different. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. (laughs) But no, but you're so right. That's but that's why for so long, for like when the woke stuff first started happening, they tried to use that intuition, the Overton window, against everyone by saying, "Oh, you know, your speech is violence, right? Your speech is advocating for violence. Even if you're not directly advocating for violence, I'm going to use some kind of like crazy dog whistle conspiracy map corkboard to show you're actually talking about violence and here we have a woman who is directly calling for violence and advocating and, and cheering on violence and it's everyone like, like it's just free anything. speech right. yes <laughs> it's just right. speech yeah it's like no stop it uh afro fry cook for five dollars says a communist being okay with slaughtering civilians i for one and absolutely shocked yeah yeah not shocking um, Mr. Borelli for ten dollars says you guys should cover Abby Martin's appearance on Pierce Morgan and try to get her on if possible. Would like to hear her explain why she harshly condemns IDF but refuses to condemn Hamas on October seventh. Have you watched that, Sitch? That's it's I have pretty. Not, no, it is pretty crazy. Was this like a recent Abby thing, Martin? Like- we've we've covered Abby Abby Martin before, and she is completely insane. Right. Pierce Morgan just drills her trying to get her to say what they did on October 7th was wrong. And she's just like in this terminal, like <laughs> brain loop where she can't, she just can't do it. Mm-hmm. And Piers Morgan keeps just hammering her. I just don't understand why you can't do it, Abby. It's just so simple. That's how, I mean, I, yeah, I'll watch it. That sounds like there was some other guy he was talking to the same thing, you know, wouldn't, uh, it was that doctor guy, you know, oh, just yeah, yeah, yeah. Hamas, you're just like, what, like Jesus. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Look, they they won't do it because they do think they're the Gazan people were acting in self defense and that with self defense, you know, heads are gonna roll and they might be some innocent people killed. But I just right. at the same time you can't come out and say, Okay, look, Abby, if that's your standard, fine. Israel wants to turn Gaza into a parking lot. Okay. <laughs> They've adopted your standard. Right. Okay. If that's your standard, stick by it. Okay. Mm -hmm. You can't complain when they're saying, look, these people got to (laughs) go. Okay. Right. Uh, M8566 for five months says, when is the next Sitch? Sitch is Inferno. I love listening to the propaganda and watching Adam get triggered by the crane. (laughs) What happened? When did, what was that? The Sitch is Inferno. Whenever I get like the uh, compilations of all the mainstream media talking about oh, some story, yeah. oh yeah, and Dante's it's just horrible. Inferno, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, it, I uh, mean, if we got, I gotta wait for this. Like the next time 
there's some event and all the mainstream just has like a horrible takes about it. That's when the next Inferno will be, I guess. There's a lot going on with this NPR stuff that is kind of insane. So, Well, the interesting thing with the NPR stuff, now I haven't watched MSNBC's coverage to know if they talked about it, and I should check oh, it out. Oh, they're not talking about it. Right. Not at all. Yeah. The, the very, very interesting thing about the NPR stuff, which I didn't expect, is that almost every newspaper is reporting on it. And a lot of the newspapers are reporting on it, and they're either A, giving both sides of it, or kind of reporting it a little, like, they're still kind of biased, but also a little neutral. Like, I really expected the newspapers reporting the NPR stuff to either A, ignore it, or if they are going to report on it, just say, like, this is just another attack by the Christopher Rufo, you know, woke police CRT. And they kind of, like, pepper that in there. But but the articles, you can tell, like, so a lot of people writing these articles in mainstream publications are like, maybe that NPR guy is onto something. Yeah, they're conflicted, too, because they got to put up with this shit. <laughs> yeah, it's, it is interesting. That seems like there's imagine? a turning point coming around the bend here. Can you imagine working on a story, like fact checking it, and then somebody coming in and saying, "Oh well, you know, politics don't uh, make it impossible for us to run this story as is. You need to rewrite it." Yeah, that's it is that's got to be painful. Mm -hmm. But wait, this is the truth. Shut up. <laughs> you want to help Trump win? <laughs> But it's the truth. Uh, M8566 for two hours says, we need a stitch emoji for, there you go. We do, yeah. I do say there that you quite go. often. There, there you go. go. There, you, there go. you go. There you go. The Real Haltonator for $5 says, as not left person, I feel like we're occupied by leftists sometimes. Uh, Metal Face Rose for five, six, seven, no, five, yeah, seven dollars. Thanks so much. Says, do you think Brianna and Robbie do it sloppy and raw after every debate? <laughs> I bet they call each other slurs doing it. Wow. Listen, I don't I don't endorse <laughs> oh this. My uh, God. I don't endorse this, okay? I don't endorse oh this God. speculation. I aren't they I think they're both married, so right. I think that I think would be are, yeah. an infidelity. So how dare right. you how dare, how dare you dare ship you? the two of them? But mm -hmm. terrible. Yeah. Uh, sketch for five dollars says have you guys seen the clip of tucker on c-span 25 years ago where he describes modern day tucker to a t i have seen that clip maybe we'll watch that or react to it i don't know if today maybe tomorrow or some other point I it is not seen it kind of hilarious it's basically tucker criticizing uh pat buchanan and the criticism he's leveling at level leveling at pat buchanan are all things that describe tucker's own personality like exactly today it's hilarious wow. Awesome. And he's calling him a grifter. It's really funny. <laughs> Some people do think Tucker is just all grift. I, I think Tucker is not all grift, but like a lot of grift. I think he's super grifty. He lies pretty, pretty often. Pretty readily. Yeah. Uh, that darn kid for 13 months. Thank you so much. 13 months says face revealed by Sitch to celebrate this milestone. Yay. Thanks. <laughs> Look at that. Wow. Look at that. Maybe not. Maybe sometimes. Months. Not thirteen months. Well, I mean, how when you get two years? Reveal. When you get when you get that golden pyramid, kiddeth. Maybe then we'll get the face reveal. How about that? I'm working on the face reveal for such guys. Adam just, is. Yeah. Yeah. He is. He's working hard behind the scenes here. I'm getting ready. Yeah. I got my camera set up. He just has uh, to walk in front of the window. <laughs> Adam has hired someone to spy on me and to set cameras like all around where I live to, so he can catch me like a paparazzi. It's just a matter of time. Yep. Uh, Christian Baller for $5 says, Adam, if you could only listen to audiobooks narrated by Sam Cedar or Hassan for the rest of your life, who do you choose? Oh, that's easy. I choose death. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want like the massive pausing and stuttering of Sam Cedar and Hassan to read your audiobooks for all time. <laughs> Look, you, you, Christian, you have devised an excellent <laughs> form of torture. I will confess any, after all the ums and ahs from that duo, I mean, I'll tell you anything you want to hear. <laughs> can you, can you imagine? Like the book would be 35 hours long. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I choose death. Death. <laughs> Death is the best route. 
Uh, Magna Defender 98 for $10 says the worst community on the web is the Arkoof subreddit. Like the rest of Reddit, the sub is populated by clinically depressed weirdos who virtue signal all day. It's a good way to rot one's brain. What is well, Ar- I've never, Arkoof? I don't is know if that's like... a, a pro. I don't know if they're pro or anti uh, the, the vaccine lockdown f- from the name of that. I assume it's right. related to one of those things. But uh, I've never been there. It sounds like you should. You should. We sound like no one should go there. It sounds like just a terrible thing to do. Sometimes you gotta like not walk into the the cesspool, right? But it's good content. It can be. It can What's be. It? But you gotta you gotta be careful because I used to do the same thing. I used to walk into the cesspool, and obviously I still do that to an extent to find content for the show. You gotta be careful when you're gazing into the abyss. Okay. Right. Yeah. Uh, cameraman five five hundred two for ten dollars says her statement is dumber. The Haitian Revolution was 30 years long, but the last event was genocide. So the whole conflict from 48 might be a fair comparison. Breeze flattening October 7th to the whole conflict. Well, there you go. Wow. That's a good point. 30 years. That's a lot of fighting. Uh, Solid for Fight R says, not to sound like a chud. Uh Uh-oh. But do you think the opening scene of Men in Black is woke? Particularly the, quote, go on protecting us from dangerous aliens. I mean, it's been a while since I've seen Men in Black. Isn't um, that where there's they're apprehending a bunch of illegal aliens, and it turns out one of the illegal aliens is a is a real alien, space alien. A space oh, that's right. Alien. Yeah, yeah. There's a bunch of people that are presumably from Mexico Ice. or Latin America. Yeah. are stopped by border patrol, and they're in like a truck. Yeah, and then like the one of them is a space alien, and then the, he's gonna go kill the border patrol guy and then they blow him up but I they do I let the they let the illegal aliens go and they're very like welcome to america so it is right. i mean you could call it woke sure maybe i mean i kind of interpreted the line i don't remember it's been a long time but i think i interpreted the line like go on protecting us from dangerous aliens it wasn't like it was just kind of like by comparison of actual you know killer space aliens so it's more like a joke it wasn't like necessarily making a political statement so I would say it's probably not woke. No, I think they were. I think that was that was the beginning of woke Hollywood, right there. Okay, right there, back in nineteen ninety, yeah. whenever that movie came out. <laughs> Electro for two twenty dollars. Thank you so much. It says S class is the best class. An A team keeps their pools green. Wow, look at that. You gotta you gotta clean your pool, Adam. You gotta change the. Aura. I'll do no such thing. Okay. Uh, more than halfway through the deficit myth, and I find it so weird that she is so certain about a carbon tax when the nuclear option is right there, loving the book. Well, there you go. Look at that. Oh, yeah. Glad you like it. Yeah, I don't... I think Stephanie Kelton does... She's obviously you know a, a progressive and runs right. in those circles, so I don't subscribe to a lot of her policies, but I do think she's right about the the macroeconomic monetary system. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mike Hassan for two says, smash that like button if you like ass. That's right. That's right, yeah. But wait, no, that's, no. Adam smash it if Sitch you like show. sass, okay? Sass, stop it. Actual justice word, look at that. It's Sean what? for $10. Sean. Thank you, Sean, for the $10. That's so nice of you. Sean says, here, take my money, even though the show is taped and not live. But I DM both of you the best topic for Sunday. Did you know? Okay, cool. I'll check it out. Yeah, thanks for the super Dude. chat, man. That's mighty nice of you. Oh, yeah, I saw that. That was the Squatter's Right clip. Yeah, I haven't watched it yet, but it's on my list of potential things for Sunday, so I'll check it out. As a homeowner, squatters terrify me, Sitch. Mm. Yeah. Well, you're in your home. Are you going to go on vacation and come back, and they're going to be like living there? Yeah, not yeah. likely. Yeah, since I basically never leave, it's it's unlikely, but still scary. Go. Listen, I'm not a shut in. Okay, I'm just protecting my home from squatters. Yeah, exactly. There you go. Take that, world. Uh, no matter for ten dollars says just got here, and I already agree with Sitch. Well, that's the way you should always be. You just show up and you just agree with me, right? You think that these kind of activists would learn from the BLM riots? You disturb the public because your issues will just make people go against you. If they actually cared, but it's not about logic or reason or actually getting anything accomplished, just about letting out their emotion. Yeah. My emotions. My emotions. Stack for um, $2 says Hassan would be eating during the whole recording. That's a good point. 
That's a good point, Adam. I guess you'd have to so take Sam because as bad Sam as Sam's Cedar. ums and ahs are, at least he wouldn't be stuffing his face while he was reading the book. Sam Cedar's ten times as smug. But he's not. He'd be so smug you don't have the like whole the, time. He doesn't have the mouth sounds, ASMR chewing sounds that you despise so much no, in your ear. death. I choose death. There's no <laughs> okay. other option. Okay. It's two great topics. Total crime denial and squatter nonsense. Ooh, okay, nice. Moondog Fried R says, I listened to the episode with you on Jesse Single. It was a good episode, but the surprise clip of your view of BDS felt out of nowhere, felt trappy. Uh, no, it actually wasn't because uh, Jesse uh, told me that he wanted to talk about that specific thing, and he actually sent me some of his notes on specific questions he wanted to ask me, so it wasn't trappy at all. What is What was the BDS? I haven't listened to it yet. I'll listen to it today, though. I didn't um, know it was out. No, I went on Jesse's podcast. I thought it was great. Uh, just a question of like, well, you know those kids that like stayed in the office of the the dean's office at that college, right? That we yeah you know, we talked about this, and mm -hmm. um, and he you know he asked me like you know should we be making fun of the kids because they're you know advocating for something that I personally agree with that I don't think that states should be enacting these anti BDS laws. My response to him on the podcast was. Well, even though I don't support these anti-BDS laws, I think that's horribly anti-free speech. And I don't even know how they're constitutional. Um, is that if those kids want to protest that law, they should protest the people that change those law that affect those laws. They should go protest at the con at Congress, at their local Congress, at the state Congress House. What is sitting in their dean's office going to accomplish? It's the same thing that we're talking about with like people blocking traffic. Yeah. Okay. Like if you want to protest against the anti-BDS laws, go protest at Congress. Don't just sit in your dean's office like a whiny little baby and complain. So, Target the right people. But they would argue, well, my dean has to listen to me because I pay tuition. <laughs> but no, Jesse told me that that's what we're going to talk about. So, uh, so for $5 hours says, have you seen the clip of Tucker where he says, quote, everybody used to believe segregation was the worst thing ever. I have not seen that clip. No, is it, by the way you asked that? Is he implying that it's not the worst thing ever anymore? Like, what does that mean? <laughs> I don't know what that even means. <laughs> Send it to me. I'm curious. Depends upon the segregation, right? Right. That's true. Death by Sloth for two dollars says, "Funny how lefties split hairs on quote anti-Semitism versus anti-Zionism." When for decades any criticism of immigration, inner city violence, or Islam immediately got one slapped with a racist label. Nuance for me, but not for thee. That's a great. Point. that is a great point yeah that is a great point and we should talk about that more whenever they do that but like why why is it impossible to criticize immigration without getting hit with the racist stick you know or violence without getting hit with the racist stick and actually uh, we're going to do a video that kind of hits on that topic that will come out later in the week uh, angry bell sprout for five dollars says would you guys vote to convict those removing people from bridges and roads at this point i doubt many will see it anything but dealing with terrorists um Vote, vote mm. to what? Would I say, vote? I just say one year jail time. Would, yeah, would you convict someone who who physically removes someone from blocking a bridge? Um, oh no, no, I would give them a medal. Well, I would. First of all, it depends on how, like I would have to know more, right? I, I would need context I would... to how exactly they removed the person from the bridge and how you know long they've been in front of them, and I I would want a little bit more because I am always tapped to sort of endorse you know. Oh, Those not me. Of, you know, not me. I know you, not you. I would offer a reward for bridge blockers. Right, I would say, right. listen, $500 reward for, bri for bridge blockers. Mm -hmm. Bring them in, you know, however you can. Right, right. Yeah, I'd have to know a little more information because I could, I can kind of envision scenarios where I would, where I would be in favor of giving someone some charges for that and scenarios where I wouldn't be and say, no, you know. If you are being blocked, if you were in your car and you're being blocked on a bridge, I would immediately deputize you. Oh, there as you a, go. As a sheriff of the county. <laughs> I would probably, on like eight out of 10 scenarios, lean more in that direction. Like oh, I'd be good. more likely to let the person off than not. So, right. Uh, Angry Bell's on a bridge. It's the perfect opportunity to like. Throw them off a bridge. Okay, right? no, nah, nah, that's <laughs> that I don't agree with. Okay, don't throw anyone off a bridge. Okay, but you have to ask them if they can swim first. 
Okay. It doesn't matter how they answer, but. Uh, Fondue for five says, I don't think this would happen if they got charged if someone didn't make it to the hospital for blocking traffic. If that happens, I've never, I mean, actually, I think I heard, have heard of that happening at least once. But yeah, if that happened, 100% of the people should be 1,000% charged. With any, Can you imagine bring them anything. all up on murder charges? I think not only should anyone, well, here was an interesting question, and maybe this is the solution, is not to like allow this kind of violence. Anyone that takes any sort of uh, problem from that action should be able to sue, right? So not just like, so anyone that's, you know, trying to get to the hospital, but anyone who misses a flight, anyone who, or anyone who, you know, uh, loses out of, you know, going to work or something. I think you should be able to sue all those people financially mm -hmm. for any losses that you know have occurred because of that action. Solo for five dollars says, "I don't have Twitter." Come on, Solo. What are you doing? You got to be on Twitter so you can argue with retards. Come on. He made a mouth movement that looked like B, like he was going to say best. Oh, everyone used to believe segregation was the. Oh, you think he was going to say best, but he said worst because like his mouth movement. Oh, I don't. I haven't seen that clip now. I haven't seen that clip. That sounds funny, though. Did you see? You know, it's funny. I don't think we're going to watch it, but um, we're going to talk about the NPR thing in a second. But I just want to talk. They, were, they had on um, Pierce Morgan, they had Alan Dershowitz uh, talking and some other people kind of arguing about, you know, the OJ thing because OJ just died. Right. It was, wasn't, Dershowitz was one of his attorneys, I believe. Dershowitz was one of his attorneys, yeah. yes. And it was hilarious because the way Dershowitz, like, very very carefully described like oj it seemed very very clear that he thought oj was guilty of murder <laughs> but you know, look but, i've seen this before right but thought that like because the police planted evidence that it made sense for the jury to say that they didn't find him guilt that they wasn't beyond reasonable doubt i was like that's how, like the way he worded it was very specific it was really funny Dershowitz, I've heard Dershowitz say that he believes OJ was guilty. Mm -hmm. Which most people do. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's talk about the NPR situation. So what happened here? What's the okay. backstory on NPR? So why do, why should we cover, care? Right, so we've been covering the story uh, about this guy named Ur Uri Berliner? I always say his name wrong. Yuri. Ooh. Yeah. Yuri. Berliner. Yuri Berliner, uh, who was a senior editor at NPR, and he basically wrote a long op-ed where he was talking about how NPR over the last some years has become more and more and more an echo chamber for left-wing ideas, more and more ideologically biased. And it's a very good right. article. We did a whole video on it, and you should check it out if you haven't seen it. And then... You know, people, a lot of people talking about this story. Uh, then the current CEO of NPR, uh, Catherine Marr, what's her name? Uh, she made a long statement in response to his article, which we also covered, which I believe we just released today, right? We did, yeah. Yeah, which you should check out if you haven't seen it yet. Uh, and all the kind of bizarre, terrible cope and nonsense uh, that she put out in response to everything that he said instead of actually, you know, addressing, you know, the anything substance. he actually said, the substance of anything. <laughs> yeah. Like right. Right. Basically just, you know, uh, danced around the issue, essentially called him a racist bigot, you know, seems like nothing's going to change with NPR. Well, I, I did notice that you, you speculated that he would think some of the things she said in that response were accusing him of being a big fat racist bigot. Yes. And in this, in this article, this now a response to the response article, it does seem as though he feels as the statements she made were out of line in calling him racist. A hundred percent. Yes. A hundred percent. Right. So you were so correct now, in that right. speculation. I was correct. I'm always correct. And, <laughs> and, but here's what's kind of interesting. So now we have an NPR article. So this is from NPR, yeah. which is an article which is talking about how Yuri has been suspended for five days without pay for writing his op-ed. Right, okay. yeah. So the, the, the saga continues. And 
apparently if he does if he's out of line again in a similar capacity he will be fired okay so this is his final warning so there's some parts of this article i want to i want to read with you and share with you and can talk about okay NPR has formally punished Yuri Berliner, the senior editor who publicly argued a week ago that the network had, quote, lost America's trust by approaching news with a rigidly progressive mindset. Yet the public radio network is grappling in other ways with the fallout from Berliner's essay for the online news site, The Free Press. It angered many of his colleagues and led NPR leaders to announce monthly internal reviews of the network's coverage and gave fresh ammunition to conservative, partisan Republican critics of NPR, including former President Donald Trump. Oh, oh my oh, word. He oh, emboldened no. the enemy. Oh, my God. Which is what they usually care about the most. You know, same thing that happened with, with Anna. Like, did you see who's been retweeting Anna whenever she criticizes something on the left? Oh, my God. It's Ben Shapiro. <laughs> Conservative activist Christopher Rufo is among oh, those no. now. Yeah, there is the oh, Christopher Rufo is among those now targeting NPR's. I like to say targeting. It's a very weird way of saying it. Targeting NPR's new chief executive Catherine Marr for messages she posted to social media years before joining the, the network. Among others, those posts include a 2020 tweet that called Trump racist, and another one that appeared to minimize rioting during social justice protests that year. Mark we go through job. all those. We go through all those tweets in our video too, so you should check it out. Yeah, in our video, it's we insane. go through all of her crazy tweets. It's funny we didn't really talk about the Trump racist one because, like, obviously, if you're trying to be an impartial journalist, you shouldn't, you know, be writing about that. Um, but in terms of like left wingness, that's not that you know that's not so crazy. Like, I think most people on the left think Trump is racist. The other things that she was saying were like so much more. So I, I do think it's kind of interesting that they. That in this article, they fixate on probably the most mild of her tweets in terms of showing her bias. Right, yeah. Didn't she defend looting? Yes, she, she <laughs> appeared to defend looting. Uh, she was 100% like regurgitating stuff about like the evil white, mate, you know, patriarchy, you know, white silence is complicity, you know, all this hyper woke nonsense. I mean, doesn't this lady look like the type of person that wants to see looting in her neighborhood? <laughs> of course it does All right, uh, in a statement right. Monday about the messages she posted Marr praised the integrity of NPR's journalists and underscored the independence of their reporting she said quote in America everyone was entitled to free speech as a private citizen she said what matters is NPR's work and my commitment as its CEO public service and editorial independence and the mission is to serve all of the American public. NPR is independent, beholden to no party, and without commercial interests. Well, does anyone actually believe, even the people that really like NPR, does anyone actually believe that NPR is ideologically independent? Like, that's a joke. That's a complete and utter falsehood. Yeah, it's delusional, but that's what they believe. I don't think they... Well, I, I think it's, to me... I think it's sneaky language. Like, yes, NPR is independent in terms of it's not officially affiliated with a political party and it's not officially affiliated with an organization, but it's not, it doesn't have any sort of independent thought. It's all hyper left wing biased echo chamber nonsense at NPR, or at least 99% of it is. They think progressivism is independent. They think progressivism is just. That's mainstream thought. Right. They think reality is bias. They think the left is just correct and true. Yes. And so like, that's why you shouldn't exactly try to right. be, yeah. And that's why you shouldn't try to be even handed. Cause then you're just being dishonest. Cause the left knows what's true and the right doesn't. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, she also said, and this is laughable. The network noted that the quote CEO is not involved in editorial decisions. Now this is like a, this is a, a lie. It's like a weird lie because obviously, yeah, the, so the CEO is probably not sitting there on a daily basis making editorial decisions about stories. That's true. But if, you know, when we, if you remember when we went over uh, Yuri's statement, if the CEO 
from a very top-down approach is creating a, a, an environment where they're saying, listen, our North Star, the most important thing here at NPR is that we fight against white supremacy and that we need to be pushing DEI. We need you know, equity in all our stories. We need to be fighting the white systemic abuse in our society. If your CEO is saying that, that's 100% editorial decisions. You're completely shaping the way all the stories will look after that, which is what the CEO of NPR did. Yeah. In an interview with me later on Monday, a Berliner said the social media post demonstrated Marr was all but incapable of being the person best poised to direct the organization. Quote, we're looking for a leader right now who's going to be unifying and bringing more people into the tent and having a broader perspective on sort of what America is all about, Berliner said. And this seems to be the opposite of that. <laughs> well, that's True. the understatement of the year, right? Yeah, of course. But you're when you're talking, when you're going on and on and on about how like there's all this horrible white, you know, systemic racism and that all white people need to stand up against it. Like, yeah, that's definitely not sending any signals to anyone but the far left that you're on their team and that you're trustworthy. Uh, Berliner provided me with a copy of the formal rebuke to review. NPR did not confirm or comment upon his suspension for this article. In presenting Berliner's suspension Thursday afternoon, the organization told the editor he had failed to secure its approval for outside work for other news outlets, as is required of NPR's journalists. It called the letter a, quote, final warning, saying Berliner would be fired if he violated NPR's policy again. Berliner is a dues-paying member of NPR's newsroom union, but says he is not appealing the punishment. Well, I mean, that's one of those things that's like, I guess that's technically true. So I guess it's technically fair if they have some agreement, which makes sense. And if you work at NPR and you're going to publish something with another outlet, you have to get permission. So I guess that's fair. I guess that's fair. But I do wonder if the politics were reversed, if they would have gotten any trouble or not. If it was someone complaining that NPR was like racist or something. Uh, the free press is a site that has become a haven for journalists who believe that mainstream media outlets have become too liberal. In addition to his essay, Berliner appeared in an episode of his podcast, Honestly, with Barry Weiss, which I listened to. And it's, it's good. People should listen to it. His essay and subsequent public remarks stir deep anger and dismay within NPR. Ooh, shocking. Colleagues contend Berliner cherry-picked examples to fit his arguments and challenge the accuracy of his accounts. They also note he did not see comment from the journalists involved in the work he cited. Okay, well, obviously, when you're calling out all your coworkers or a lot of your coworkers as being ideological hacks, I mean, they're not going to necessarily listen. like that. Yeah. Hey, you're an ideological hack. Would you care to right. comment? I wonder if he should have like like wrote this whole story up as if it was going to be published in NPR, so it got comment from everyone and did like like done all these things. And then when they like turn them down, people don't give them the comments, all this stuff. Then he just, then he just publishes it in the free week and say, listen, I tried to do it like through NPR through all, I asked all you guys and you all just, you know, you all just BS, you know, didn't want to do it. Shunned me. Uh, Morning edition host, Michael Martin told me some colleagues at the network share Berliner's concerns that coverage is frequently presented through an ideological or idealistic prism that can alienate listeners. So that's, so that's very interesting. So again, this is in NPR. So the NPR article is saying that another person at NPR shares the concerns and that other people share the exact same concerns about NPR, which that that's not nothing. That is very interesting that the uh, NPR printed this. Uh, quote, the way to address this is through training and mentorship, says Martin, herself a veteran of nearly tw two decades at the network, who was also reported for the Wall Street Journal and ABC News. It's not by blowing the place up by trashing your colleagues in full view of people who don't really care about it anyway. Oh, never mind. So I guess that was sort of a <laughs> never mind. Take it all back. I guess it was kind of like, a, well, you know, it's a problem, but fuck you. You did it wrong anyway. So yeah, those people that those listeners that they're alienating are evil conservatives, Sitch, right, obviously right. they need to alienate them. Well, and I don't think he Yuri didn't na he didn't name anyone in his article. Except for the CEO, which is fine. He did name various stories, which people probably, the writers of those stories were like, he's talking about me. Oh my yeah, God. Yeah, I guess. I guess. Yeah. But whatever. They suck. Get over yeah. it. 
Several NPR journalists told me they are no longer willing to work with Berliner as they no longer have confidence that he will keep private their internal musings about stories as they work through coverage. Oh, poo, poo, poo. Quote, newsrooms run on trust, says NPR political correspondent Daniela Herzl-Ben last week, without mentioning Berliner by name. If you violate everyone's trust by going to another outlet and shitting on your colleagues while doing a bad job journalistically for the matter, I don't know how you do your job now. Oh, oh, oh. Berliner rejected that critique, saying nothing in his essay or subsequent remarks portrayed private observations or arguments about coverage. Yeah, the only the only thing he said about a private conversation, there was one unnamed, unsourced quote where the person about I think it was about the Hunter Biden laptop story, right? Saying that they were glad they didn't have to report on it because they don't want to help Trump. And that was right. the only thing that he like specifically quoted. I didn't say who said it. Uh, on Friday. CEO Marr stood up for the network's mission and the journalism and journalism, taking issue with Berliner's critique, though never mentioning him by name. Among her chief issues, she said that Berliner's essay offered a quote criticism of our people on the basis of who we are. That's now that the line, yeah, right. That is the line where she's, in my opinion, straight up defaming him, <laughs> saying that he's a horrible bigot racist when he literally said nothing but that of all. Right. Berliner took great exception to that, saying she had denigrated him. He said that he supported diversifying NPR's workforce to look more like the U.S. population at large. She did not address that in a subsequent private exchange he shared with me for this story. Okay, so, so he acknowledged that. Late Monday afternoon, uh, Chapman announced the newsroom and the executive editor, Evan Eva Rodriguez, would lead monthly meetings to review the coverage. Quote, so this is what they're going to do in response to this article. They're going to have these monthly meetings. And this is what they're supposed to do. Quote, among the questions we'll ask ourselves each month, did we capture the diversity of this of this country racially, ethnically, religiously, economically, politically, geographically, etc., in all of its complexities and in a way that helps listeners and readers recognize themselves and their communities? Chapin wrote in the memo, did we offer coverage that helped them understand, even if just a bit better, those neighbors with whom they share a little in common. So, like, if you just take that statement on a on a face value, in a vacuum, it sounds good. Because you say, okay, they're trying to, you know, they literally say, do we capture the political and geographic diversity of the country? And we're trying to help make it so that neighbors understand each other. So, like, in a vacuum, that sounds good. And, you know, maybe we could be optimistic and hope something positive will come out of that. But... I'm a little cynical. Okay. I'm a little black pilled on a lot of this stuff. And I kind of look at that and I'm going to just perceive it as like a lot of lip service where they're just going to continue down the pathway of only caring about racial diversity and actually advocating for no ideological diversity and only advocating for, you know, one ideological left wing progressive view of the world. But we'll see. We will see. Yeah. I, what we're going to see is these meetings turn into just basically, you know, a, a hug, a progressive hug fest. Right. Oh right. yes, we did such a good job. Oh my God. We called out those racist Republicans. It was amazing. <laughs> we showed them the nuance of their racism. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, and Yuri basically said much. He said like, I'm like, I'm holding my breath till I'm in one of these meetings. We'll see what happens. <laughs> right. Oh, oh, look, we got a mole on the inside. I can't wait right. to hear what happens. So, yeah, we'll meetings. find out. We'll find out, hopefully. So, they're not we'll going to. I, there's going to be a lot of whispering. And then as soon as Yuri walks in, it's going to be like, okay, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> well, judging by the CEO's reaction and her politics, I think there's. I don't know, like a less than 5% chance that NPR is going to course correct in any substantive way. You know, they, they might throw a bone here and there, but I, I don't think it's going to go well. She got this job because she's woke as fuck. Yep. That's exactly what's going on here. Exactly. Yeah. She got this job because she has the right politics. Look, they're, they're running the show over there. They got basically propaganda outlet for the Democratic Party, and that's the way they're going to keep it. Mm -hmm. This is one of their. 
one of their strategic alliances on the board. Do you right. think they want to be fair and impartial, or do you think they want to get Democrats elected to office? I think they want to, I don't even know if it's they want to get Democrats elected. I think they just want to promote their progressive values to the country. You know, it's like what the former CEO said is like, you know, after seeing that George Floyd video, I just it's, knew it's that all, America was steeped in like white systemic racism and we need to fight back against that. Look, it's all integrated though. The, the Republicans don't even believe that that exists. They're apostates to this ideology. You think they want them running the country? They don't even believe their, their narrative. Yeah, no, I understand it's integrated. I'm just saying I think that that's like a second, like that's like their secondary motivation. I think their primary motivation is the ideology. I mean, Yuri pointed out a lot of different things that they were worried would send the election in the wrong direction. It was just the Hunter Biden thing. There's that, that's what we talked about, right? Well, I don't remember saying Trump. anything. Else. Yeah. But uh, the Justice 35 for 19 months says, Hey, Sitchin Adam, wanted to use this to thank Lucifer the Doberman for being an absolute Chad for supporting my weight loss. 90 pounds now. S class is best. That's amazing. Well, that's, that's, that's awesome. wonderful. Look at yeah. that. 90 pounds. That's incredible. Holy shit. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lift some weights just for you. <laughs> just okay. for you. I'm going to give you. There you Give go. Me some curls. That. Nice. Nice. I like that. We should have like, you remember how there was like the, the, uh, the thing where like all the girls would, the, would pretend to be NPCs and when they get specific donations, they'd say like something specific. Oh yeah. We should have something that people can do or they donate something to specifically get Adam to do like a couple curls. Do some curls. That'd right. Cool. Then when I'm on camera, we'll do like, you know, or you could do push ups. Oh, look at this. Yeah. Do push ups or curls, right? Get like yeah, a little pull up bar. Be great. But yeah, 90 pounds, man. That's incredible. We'll do our little pump. We're here to pump you up. We're here to pump. No one knows that reference. Come I on. know. <laughs> We're here to pump you up. That's right. Uh, Anonymous Cara for $5 says, Did you see Hassan on the iced coffee? our podcast he's still claimed being middle class and praise squatters bankrupting homeowners among other things so is I, that an old podcast no it just came out like a couple days ago it's on my uh, list of things to watch for possible sunday shows i haven't seen it yet except i think was it christian baller i think sent me a clip um which is totally insane from it where uh hassan essentially uh, was saying that like he he was he was still praising uh, second thought and specifically the podcast the second thought is on and his co-host he was praising them specifically by name these are the people that were supporting and cheering on October seventh so that was one of the more insane things that Hassan said in that situation did, did the coffee people ask him about that no they no I don't think they know they knew about it but that's too bad right. Uh, Metal Face Rose for two hours says NPR died when they got rid of Garrison Keller. I don't know who this is, and it's not his face isn't even familiar to me. So, uh, yeah, I'm not super familiar with him either, but I'll take your word for it. Uh, Brian Sh for five dollars says there was no planted evidence in the OJ trial. That was a tr claim made by the defense without evidence to influence the majority black jury. So it's been like many 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 years and i was also a child at the time so you know i could be wrong my what what alan dershowitz said in the pierce morgan clip which i vaguely remember was that he he claimed that they found blood on oj's socks that i believe was nicole brown's blood and it was in oj's house but that the blood had some chemical in it that's an anti coagulant chemical that you would not find in the human body but would only find in blood that was contained in like a test tube and that was the claim that alan dershowitz made so i don't know if that's true but that's what he said so wow. i mean if that was true that would definitely point to planted evidence if it's not true then then it's not true they took blood from the morgue and planted it in his socks that's the claim dang yeah. Uh, Mike Osborne for 12 months says, can I get some curls for 12 months? I think you can. Oh, yeah. There you go. There you go. 
There it is, man. One year of code, baby. 99. 100. Oh, wow. Man. Impressive. I can't believe it. Look at that. <laughs> Feeling buff already. I is believe it? it could have been cleaner as well. False. The chemicals common in laundry deterrent. Oh, really? Interesting. Okay. They should have had someone on Pierce Morgan that uh, <laughs> had that information because the person they had on That's didn't. actual uh, justice warrior. I saw. Yeah, Sean in said the chat. that. False. That chemical is common in laundry detergent. Like if his go. socks was was washed. They should have had. Um, they had. Who was the guy? That like got caught masturbating by accident on camera on CNN. Jeffrey Tubin. I think it was Jeffrey Tubin. <laughs> <laughs> Talking Allenders with Jeffrey Tubin didn't know the no didn't know way. that or the fact was it case. really? I think it was because he actually Jeffrey Tubin, I think, was somehow involved with some original reporting on OJ. He wrote the, he wrote a book the on OJ. The people versus OJ. So if that's anyone why knows that's why about washing it's so his socks, it's Jeffrey Tubin. So he, <laughs> he should. You know, he you would think. You would he, think, right? <laughs> he should definitely know this. <laughs> <laughs> Tubin, of all the news commentators, he should have known about proper sock, you know, uh, Hygiene, washing yeah. techniques and chemical compositions of cleaners and socks. You're right. But actually, yeah, he, since he wrote this book on O.J. Simpson, he should you think he should have known about that. If that was the defense that the state said that it was from some kind of cleaner fabric softener, he should have known that and offer that up to uh, to what's his face? Alan Dershowitz. Yeah, Dershowitz. The, the Dersh. Yeah. OK, uh, I think that's it. That's all. That's, that's everything. It. That's everything. All right, cool. Guess we'll talk to you guys tomorrow. Bye-bye. See you guys tomorrow.